Hello all, Rick here with a video on the Klingon disruptors of Star Trek. One aspect of the Federation phaser is that it was deliberately stylized not to look like a gun in the original series, it was inverted to be longer over the hand, and considering it was a futuristic device it was decided that it did not require a barrel, instead having an emitter. This gave the phaser, the trademark Starfleet weapon, more of a passive look, and better highlighted the nature of the organisation. Although I could not find a canon source citing this, it could also be applicable as an in-universe reason too. Starfleet was happy to move away from the design shapes that evoked a more hostile device. <sighs> YouTube, this is about a fictional thing, don't hide this video please. The Klingons, in opposition, still maintained that look of a more traditional firearm shape, even though the technology around it was definitely futuristic. As you'd expect, this is because they held no qualms about projecting a more aggressive appearance, and instead doubled down on that design. Of course, many still favour a batleth over a disruptor, because Klingons view that as a more honourable way of battling a foe, and will try to engineer situations where they can engage in melee combat, an area where they feel they have the advantage. The earliest disruptors we see are the ones present in Earth's first encounter with the Klingot, sorry, Klingon, at the instance of Broken Bow. We later see them used by Klingon marauders, so we can say that they are indeed somewhat considered standard issue at this time, or at least what passes for standard in a pre-Klingon Defence Force era. This device featured the curved handle and dark brown metals that would go on to feature in their later designs, but it was more blocky and geometric than others. These ones had relatively little diversity in way of settings, even for disruptors, and ranged from blasting holes to explosions. Still, their disruptor designs have changed substantially over the years, while sharing a lot of traits. In the 2250s era Klingons, well they saw a radically different design. This can be chalked up to the fact that there was no unified KDF at this time, so no standardisation of equipment, and each house maintained their preferred look and technology. The House of Tukuvma, allied with Mokai and later Kor, took precedence in this era, meaning that the gear circulated was of their designs. In fact, one detail I like about these designs was that they employ more melee functionality, which I feel makes even more sense for the Klingons. But soon, things began to return to a more commonplace design with the standardisation of the Klingon houses into a more military culture. The next disruptor we see is the early 2260s metal finished one that is more angled, with some thought given to the ergonomics of the hand. This disruptor was also known as a sonic disruptor, suggesting a deviation from using standard disruptor beam technology. However, with no breakdowns on what this entailed, I assume it uses some additional sound-based waves to shape or direct a regular disruptor beam. Although the same source I got this from also says it's identical to the tech on their ships, where sound cannot permeate through space, but maybe through a beam? This is unclear and I'm going to drop it here until I unearth more on sonic devices in Trek in general. For now though, know that this era of disruptor tech seems to be even more of an outlier than the Discovery era ones, at least in terms of how they worked. One standout feature however is that the trigger is not where the forefinger rests, but where the thumb goes, and the all silver design suggests to me that it was not painted up, so it gives it this mass produced feel. We also see this weapon in the hands of officers of the Romulan Star Empire in this time period and including the use of Klingon D7 ships by the Romulans, it is often used as proof of the brief trade in technology that must have occurred in this era, thanks to the reuse of props. Either way, it suggests that despite the animosity that the Klingons and Romulans held for each other, they did briefly cooperate for a time, and as neighbours it's not that far-fetched. By 2280, we have a whole new disruptor design, and this is probably my favourite of the lot. The new disruptor is smaller and more lightweight, with exposed metal and piping doing its all to reduce the burden of this disruptor. The brown metal sees a return in the body with a darker handle, which is unevenly sculpted to fit a palm. This does mean that you would have to have a different handle for a warrior that was left-handed, but I imagine that would be easy enough to swap out. 
The large node atop the disruptor is in fact there to house an attachment, that being a stock, which contains an expanded power pack and other technology to extend the range of the bolt fired. So, with a quick field adjustment for an away team, a Klingon could change the utility of their hand disruptor into that of a rifle. The firepower this thing could unleash was on par with a Federation phaser at setting 10, meaning complete vaporization through the disruption of atomic bombs. This disruptor would be the one that gets used and reused even into the late 24th century, becoming the mainstay of the Klingon Defence Force with some minor modifications, suggesting newer models of the same thing, such as an emitter shroud. Basically, I feel like by this time, the KDF had created its own manufacturer and was now outputting its own line of arms that just iterated on the designs that had come before. All disruptors favoured by the Klingons required energy sources to operate and recharge, and most of their models, well this was handled by an inbuilt power pack. The weapon would draw from the power pack and hold a charge in a temporary capacitor until depleted, typically a process that could be heard as a whining sound. When this was depleted, the disruptor would need to recharge, which took a little more time and was not ideal in combat situations. Measuring your shots allowed the device to prepare and top up the capacitor, and rapid usage would deplete it quicker, meaning that you would hit a point of cooldown. During this cooldown, the power pack would resupply the capacitor, and once the power pack was depleted, a full reload was needed. Or a full recharge if you had access to a point to plug it in. The only really inconsistent point that I have come across is that Klingon disruptors sometimes are capable of stunning and other times not. Essentially, disruptor tech can stun a target, although it's a much more painful affair than a Federation phaser stun, but it seems that the Klingons were more frequently expected to injure a target and capture him the old-fashioned way, with only specialised equipment issued for missions where they were to stun a target. Which, yeah, that checks against Klingon doctrine. Most of the time if they are fighting, it is to the death, because if not, they would not be drawing a disruptor. Thanks for watching this breakdown on the Klingon Disruptors, a piece of their arsenal that is very reflective of their priorities. I was intrigued by the addition of Sonic technology, so I'm probably going to do a follow-up on that implementation, and report back with a new video if I find anything of interest. After all, it could just be a quirk of reusing props in the 60s era predictions of future tech. Thanks again for watching, I've been Rick, and I'll see you later. Kerplah.